Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Dean Sharafi. I'm the region representative for Region 10, Asia Pacific, until next year. And um, I have the pleasure to introduce two IEEE PES distinguished lecturer this afternoon. So I must uh, define the last sentence that I said. So IEEE. So let's let's quickly um, see what IEEE is and what it does. So it, IEEE is the largest engineering organization in the world, and uh, we have about uh, 400,000 members in IEEE. Power and Energy Society, PES, is one of the societies, and we have uh, 38 other societies in IEEE. We have about 40,000 members, and Region 10, this region, Asia Pacific, is one of the growing regions of IEEE and Power and Energy Society. So, um, it's a global society, it's everywhere, and you can see that um, in Region 10, there's quite high number of members uh, for Power and Energy Society. I make this really short because I always go through this when we have an event, but I want to say uh, that there are multiple publications. Um, Power and Energy Society has two magazines. One of them is very, very helpful to the energy transition. Both of them. One of them is electronic, one of them is in paper. So um, if you're a member, you get the, both of them, but you get also the paper copy. So this is PES magazine, and it is pretty much focused on energy transition. So um, even um, with receiving the magazine per year, I think the $193 that you paid for both IEEE and PES is really worth it. Thank you so much. I'll go um, to introduce our first distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Jovitska Milanovic. Uh, so it's a big resume, and I'm sure you all have it. But um, yeah, I've uh, really <laughs> I've gone for a brief one, but uh, Jovitska got PhD degree from University of Newcastle in Australia and doctoral science degree from University of Manchester. Um, he is currently Professor of Electrical Power Engineering at the University of Manchester, UK, and he's the editor and a member of editorial technical boards of more than 70 international journals and conferences. Um, Professor Milanovic is a Charter Engineer in UK, Fellow of IEEE, Distinguished Lecturer, which is really a huge um, acknowledgement of uh, the knowledge, science, and speaking skills uh, to be a distinguished lecturer. So, uh, Dr. Milanovic will be the first speaker, and I quickly uh, introduce Pier Pierluigi Mancarella, who is a well-known uh, speaker here. Uh, he has been here in this very room a couple of times, and his work with my team, at least, has really resulted in huge um, development and improvement in the way we operate the power grid in Western Australia. So the real-time frequency stability team, uh, stability tool is the one we developed in um, cooperation with Pierre Luigi and was based on his um, contribution to the Finkel review that we all know and the, the inertia in, in low grid power systems. So uh, Pierre Luigi is chair professor of electrical power system at the University of Melbourne and uh, part-time professor of a smart energy system at the University of Manchester in UK. <coughs> His PhD degree was in electrical energy system from Politecnico di Torino in Italy. And he's the author of several books and book chapters, over 300 research paper, He's an editor of the IEEE Transaction on Power Systems and the new IEEE Transactions on Energy Markets Policy and Regulation. And he's also a distinguished lecturer. So please put your hands together for both of the speakers tonight. Uh, good, good afternoon. It's uh, 
excellent opportunity for me to be again in Perth after 15 years. I was here last time in 2007, when I was delivering one of the courses on power system stability uh, across Australia, so one of the stops was in Perth, and this year it was a great opportunity for me to be again here with you, because I'm visiting Pierluigi uh, at the moment in Melbourne for about a month, and before that I was a month in Queensland, so I'm covering Australia, at least parts of Australia that I haven't lived in before, because I, I lived in New South Wales and uh, Tasmania, so four states covered and counting. Uh, so today I will be talking uh, about, not exactly resilience, but the outskirts of resilience, or my understanding of resilience, and the areas that uh, my team and I have been working on over the past several years, which are kind of on the borderline of, of uh, resilience studies. Now, the, the thing why resilience somehow again became prominent is because of the changes in the system that are happening that you are all aware and we had just discussion earlier this afternoon with Dean Steam on, on changes and challenges facing uh, us and uh, as engineers and people who operate the system uh, with, with things that are happening. So what is happening? New types of generation, new types of load, different patterns of operation, stronger interconnection between different systems, loads and loads and loads of data, either numbers or digital recordings, responses, that we pretty much don't know what to do with, a lot of uncertainties uh, that we are facing both in generation and in consumption of electricity. So all this together creates a system which people say will behave differently than the system that we are used to or got used to over about 150 years since the first system was designed in about 1886 in America. So this system that we have today is not only power network. Power network obviously is monitored and controlled through the help of communication network, and they are interconnected. They talk to each other, one sends signals, measurement, the other then processes that and sends the information back, so they are closely coupled. But then, on top of that, you may have a gas network, or heat network, transport, water, all this together is actually the system that we are living within, or living with. If you lose electricity, no power, no traffic lights, etc., etc., etc. So all this working together creates a lot of problems and a lot of challenges, how to handle that. And I'll show you towards the end of the talk today how we address some of these issues of interconnected infrastructures. Now, this is the system of the future. This is the system of today, actually. So how do we monitor, operate, control this system? I don't know. <laughs> We are trying. We are learning as we go along. Now, in that scope of the system of today, pretty much not only the future, resilience is becoming more and more important. Not only because of the interconnections between different structures which are becoming much more dominant than they were in the past, but also because of the changes in climate some events are happening more frequently than before, and they tend to be more disastrous consequences than they had before. And the resilience is basically about ability to withstand disasters. Well, disasters in a sense of events that are not happening often, but when they do happen, they cause a lot of problems. Now, this has been dealt with, obviously, in the past, trying to learn from monitoring data and combining some probabilistic aspects and using different metrics to establish what is the consequence. What is the consequence if we have 
an event which causes either complete or partial blackout. These are measures that assess technical consequences of these events. Now, technical consequence is not enough because we have to monetize them somehow. So we then introduce economic, social, geographic, health and safety indices or impacts. And this together tells us about the system resilience. Now, this is something that you can find in old books, not necessarily always clearly defined, but this is not, nothing new. But in understanding of the changes that are happening in the system, three years ago, a new task force was created in IEEE, Task Force on Resilience, and they published a very good report and a research paper summarizing that report, and they came up with a slightly extended definition. This is a task force led by Professors Stankovic and Tomšević, and this is their extended definition of Resilience. Now, I highlighted in red here some of the words which are kind of important compared to what we had in previous definition, and I'm not going to go and read all of them. You can read them. The slides are available, so you can have the slides later on. I would just point to one thing here, which is this. This is something we didn't have before. We didn't have cyber attacks ever defined in assessment of resilience because that didn't exist maybe even five years ago. Uh, when we were talking about resilience. We did have climate change, we did have rare events, we did have everything else, but cyber, cyber attack, cyber security is something new that appeared only in this latest edition of definition, and this was published as uh, last, well, last month, actually, in October. Uh, this year was the report and the paper published. Now, when we talk about threats, so what is it that can cause a problem. Well, there is obviously technical faults and accidents. There are extreme weather and natural disasters. There are some attacks here, either uh, physical attacks or cyber attacks. And as we are all aware, as of unfortunate events of last couple of years, pandemics. So that stopped a lot of activities or did a reset, if you like, in the way how we work. I, wouldn't go as far as say how we live, but definitely how we work, uh, and had impact on operation of the system. Now, moving from there, when we talk about resilience, again, there are different components here. One is network resilience. This is what we are mostly familiar with, which deals with a physical assets, then there is something else, which is cyber resilience. This appeared recently. That's, again, something that people often talk about or more frequently start to talk about, cyber resilience. But this thing here, workforce resilience. I've never read in any technical paper mentioning workforce resilience, when they talked about system resilience. I only became aware of this over the last two or three years when I started working very closely with some of the utilities in the UK in developing their business plans for next uh, regulatory period, when this became a key factor, workforce resilience. So do we have people who are going to run this network safely, economically, restore it if need be? Do we have right skills? Do we have enough of them? I was mentioning earlier in the, in the meeting, everybody in the UK now, in utilities, in power utilities, are recruiting data analysts. Not electrical, well, yes, of course, electrical power engineers. But for every one advertisement for electrical power engineer, there are two or three for data analysts. In power utilities. Everybody is doing that. So, very simple question, do we have enough data analysts to work in the power industry? Because everybody wants them. They work in insurance companies, in banks, in oil industry, in this industry, in that. Do we have enough of these people to work where? 
where we are interested in, which is in power. So this is an aspect of workforce resilience. So can we employ right people? Just one of them. That's why I put it here, just to, to draw your attention, because most of you here are from industry, and you are facing these problems much more uh, acutely than, than us in academia. We are just talking about something, not actually doing real work. <laughs> now, challenges that we have for this system of the future or of today, depending in different parts of the world, the system of the future that I'm referring to is the system of today. In some other parts, it's still system of the future. So one thing is the data, uh, more and more of it, and I already mentioned data analysts, so how do we handle such amount of data efficiently, efficiently? I'm not going to talk about whether we need all this data or whether we thought what we need. I'm just talking about we have the data, we have people, people can't handle this many data efficiently, so there has to be something to help us getting what we need to get from this data. Now I'm using these vague terms, getting what we need to get, because I'm not sure that we know what we want to get. Everyone, if, if I go around the room and ask each of you, what do you think we should know? I'm sure we will come, maybe not with as many answers as there are people in the room, but with a very large number of answers. We still haven't decided what key information we want to extract. And if you go company, from company to company, there may be different accents, aspects of the information that you want to get. Depending on what you want to get, you may need to have different data from different parts of the network with different resolution. Well, we didn't think about that when we installed all these monitors. There are monitors there, they're sending information, we are piling it up in a powerful, ever and ever more and more powerful uh, servers, and what do we do with it? Who can handle that unless we apply some fancy stuff called data analytics to process this quickly and to get the information out? The other thing is uncertainties. Now, uncertainties are reality of life, not only in, in power system engineering, in all aspects of life. And if you move from power system engineering, there are even more uncertainties than in the power systems. But power system has enough of them for us to worry about. It had enough in the past, and that number is only growing. It's growing because load and generation are becoming actually more uncertain by the minute. Load was always uncertain, but we could predict it. You know, we knew what people are going to do when they are cooking, bathing, you know, making toast for breakfast, going to sleep, industry starts working. So we knew that. But then there are new types of load. Electric vehicles are typical examples, uh, which didn't exist before, and which are here now, growing, finally started to grow more rapidly, uh, as some people predicted 10 years ago. I remember maybe 15 years ago uh, at discussion in, in Lisbon, in Portugal, someone from the government, uh, Portuguese government, said in a year time there will be one million electric vehicles on the roads of Portugal. That was 15 years ago. I doubt they have a million vehicles now. Uh, so the uptake was slower than anticipated, but you all, I'm sure, have witnessed in the last five months or six months, maybe a year, the number of these uh, cars, electric cars, is growing. The problem with them is, at the moment, uh, they can move. <laughs> You know, previously, uh, you didn't know what am I doing in my house, whether I'm making toast, taking shower, cooking, whatever, but you knew where my house is. Now, you don't know where my car is. Well, you, you can find it, but you can't predict where it is going to be or can't predict uh, accurately enough. So the load started to move, and then, well, am I charging or discharging? For how long? Is it fast charging, slow charging? That all will affect the system. So this is element of load uncertainty we have before. And I'm not going to talk about wind and, 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 and PV uncertainties because you are all aware of that. So 
Uh, I want to show one thing that when I, when I talk about this thing, I say where we have a problem of load spatial and temporal changes and generation spatial and temporal changes and people, uh, renewable generation. And people sometimes without, you know, uh, for me being uh, weighed in, in staying, saying this, say, what do you mean uh, spatial change of generation? I mean, if you build a wind farm at a particular location, it won't move. It stays where it is. Example, so this is a system with wind farms uh, over and there, and if the wind is blowing, a production is different. So it's not only load profile that changes, it's generation profile. And then we have to change, obviously, scheduling of synchronous generators becomes different. So operating condition of the system changes and changes more rapidly. And these generators are then moving. How they are moving? Take the system with the symbols here indicating where renewable generators are. So if we take, say, 6 o'clock in the morning, these three generators are working because the wind is blowing there. A few hours later, some other generators are working. A few hours later, some others, and so on. So the generators did not physically move, but the power is injected at different locations. So this is, this is what matters. It doesn't matter whether the generator physically moves. It matters that the power injection location moves. For all these movements, the operating condition of the system changes. So this is practically equivalent of spatial change in generation. You can say, yes, we have that in the past in synchronous generators. Yes, we did. We did. But we can predict this much more accurately. With wind and solar and clouds, these movements are much more frequent and much less controllable. Now, so the challenge is how do we model everything? How do we model Generation, how do we model demand that is uncertain and changes geographically and temporarily? How do we model, another discussion from earlier this afternoon, how do we model inverters, either grid following or grid forming, interactions among them? How do we model one wind turbine or do we model a whole wind farm? How do we do that? There are ways, obviously, doing it. But then, how do we model wind farm and PV plant connected together to the same medium voltage bus, which is possible, or some other technologies? So we are not talking about modeling a cluster of the same type of generators. We are talking about modeling a clusters of several different technologies. We know how to model, for example, hydro power plant with six generators. Equivalent model is easy. We learned that. We've been learning it for 150 years, so I think we learned it by now. But how do we model a wind farm with 50 generators? What is the equivalent model? Obviously, one would say, hey, well, a single generator, you just increase the power. But yeah, that's true. It is possible to do it in that way, but that's accurate only if we assume that every single wind turbine receives the same wind, which never is the case. Now, there is always some wake effect, some shade in which some generators are. So you never actually have all, say, 50 generators receiving the same wind speed. If they don't receive the same speed, the power output will be different. So the equivalent model will not be one gen, it will not be accurate. Only except when a whole, every single generator receives the same wind. We've done some work on that in the past and, and demonstrated how big difference can actually be if you are doing a single wind, uh, single turbine equivalent, or if you do equivalent which is formed of more than one uh, wind generator. So the issue is that modeling all these uncertainties is not possible by doing it in the way how we've done in the past, using the deterministic study. So some, something else has to be done, more probabilistic approaches. So cha challenges that we have now is how to control system like that, how to control the system about which we have data and we are not entirely sure which data we have or how to use them, and in particular the system which has variation in demand, in generation, in operating conditions, and all that is answered. So controlling that is becoming a serious, serious challenge. So challenge number three is control of the system. And that control, obviously, 
will have to be, in a way, hierarchical. There are people who are arguing centralized control, people who are arguing hierarchical control, people who are arguing decentralized or distributed control. All of those have their role to play depending on the type of the study or the type of the problems you're trying to solve. But there is no one silver bullet that will solve the controllability problem. So different options have to be explored. And more and more, we are looking into this, risk limiting control. So controlling the system in such a way that the risk of something going wrong is minimized. We can't afford to design a control system or to design a system which will be foolproof 100%. We can, yeah, if we have money. I remember many years ago when I was working more substantially in the area of power quality than I do today, and I was talking with people who are producing uh, power quality mitigation devices, you know, um, Stockholms, SVCs, etc. Power quality conditioners. And they said, look, there is no power quality problem that we cannot solve today. We have devices which can completely remove every single power quality problem that you are talking about. The only issue is money. Who is going to pay for it? So we can design a control system which will be close to 100% reliable and secure and, and efficient. But it's a lot of money. So we have to think about designing control infrastructure which will be good and not too expensive. So, moving from there, one aspect is when you do this modeling of different components, you need to estimate what's going on in the system. You need to know what is happening in the system first. Then you have to develop models of new technologies. There are more and more high voltage DC lines, the system gets decoupled, but eventually we can handle this thing, model. How do we control it? One way of doing it is to have a real-time controller which gets some information from the system and then deploys uh, corresponding signals when they are needed. So what I was, uh, my team and I were playing with is can we use the data from existing monitors, say PMUs, wherever they are? If you take, say, Western Australia system, I don't know how many PMUs you have, but if you, if you take your system and if you have, say, 20 PMUs at particular locations, this is what we use as the input, only that. And then we design a control structure, and we are obviously observing the system all the time. So depending on the fault in the system or a problem we have, we deploy control signals only to those locations which are most effective. Clearly, we need to have communication established between a controller here, or control center, if you like, and many points in the network, but we don't use all of them. We only activate the links or the locations which will be most efficient for a given disturbance. So what I'm talking about, this controller, will always have the same number of inputs, but the outputs will be different. And they will be measured to the control task that is uh, ahead of us. Now, I'll show you some of the uh, areas, I, I, I've chosen a few, uh, that we were working in um, over past 10 or so years, which are tackling some of these problems. And this is obviously not my uh, work uh, alone, if at all. This is a group of people who worked with me on this at different stages of the, of the work you're going to see. And I'll start with probabilistic modeling. So we are doing pretty much everything probabilistic now, moved completely away from deterministic studies, to appreciate the fact that we don't know much about both generation and the load or not only both, but all, 
generation load and operating conditions. So to, to take care of that, we are modeling pretty much every aspect of system operation using appropriate probability distributions, whether it's generation load, operating conditions, uncertainties in forecasts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then with that, the, the, next, step, the next thing in any probabilistic modeling is to establish what matters. So do we need to model everything? or only some parts of the system. This is the sensitivity studies. Now, how do you do sensitivity study in a 50,000 bus network with I don't know how many components? Do you model every single component separately? Yeah, it can be done. But do you have enough engineers to deploy them to do that? So what we developed is a method for very quick and fast scanning of what matters what needs to be modeled, that's one thing. And the second thing, how accurately, which is more important. And I illustrate that on example of load modeling. So it's a network with a lot of loads, and each load is modeled by a particular load model. Adopted from literature, the ones that we are using are the static load models or dynamic load models. Doesn't really matter which load model. You take your network and your load models that you're using at the moment. So the question is, how accurate particular parameter of a load at particular location needs to be? Now, there are two answers to that question. First one is, what for? If you want absolute accuracy of the load model, clearly you are going to develop it to 10th decimal place. Do you need it? Does it actually matter? So what matters? What matters is how accurate that model, either load or any other component, needs to be so that your system studies are accurate enough. So we are defining accuracy of components modeling based on its influence or based on their influence on the results of system studies. So here is the influence of load models on system stability or different system stabilities. You have here small disturbance stability, transient. This is a lot of um, frequency and uh, voltage stability. So four different types of stability, different buses. So what we can do, we can do the following. We can specify how accurate needs to be each parameter at each location for the results of our respective stability study to be within 1% with 95% confidence level. So, if I model at bus 17 this parameter with 1.5% accuracy, all small disturbance stability studies will be within 1% error 95% of the time. And you can do that for different type of studies. And you can see, depending on which type of stability studies you are doing, you can specify how accurate each model needs to be. So why does it matter? Well, it matters because if I can identify that there is a particular bus or particular generator or particular transformer in the system that needs to be modeled very accurately, I can then, as a manager, for example, deploy two or three people to go there and develop that model to that accuracy. But only to that accuracy that is needed. Otherwise, I would employ Professor Milanovic, give him a lot of money to develop load models for all loads in Western power network. Professor Milanovic should be happy because he'll get a lot of money for developing load models. You will have all the load models. Do you need them? Do you need them? Do you actually need them? So what we are trying to do here is to approach the problem from the perspective of apply the right tool for the right problem. The problem is you want to be confident that your studies, whether it's load flow, voltage stability, frequency stability, economic dispatch, whatever, you want to be confident that your studies are accurate 
For these studies, you need to model different components of the network. What we are answering with this is which components need to be modeled and how accurately. And you deploy people to develop these models to that level of accuracy so that your results of the studies are accurate. Next thing that we are looking at is corrective control. Now, as you know, corrective control is something that we do after the events happen, not in advance, after. For that, the speed is of the essence. So we have to act very, very quickly. Now, all textbooks, papers, research papers, everything tells you that for transient stability, which we are obviously worried about, uh, the indication of instability of our generator losing stability is when its angle is more than 180 degrees with respect to center of inertia or the alternative definition when any two angles of the generators are more than 360 degrees right for that to happen when the fault happens there is certain period of time that passes before two rotor angles separate certain number of degrees. Right? There is a time. What we are trying to do is, can we do it faster? Can we do it, can we make that call? The system is becoming unstable before the angles separate 360 degrees or 180. And this point here, this point here, tells us actually at what point in time we can call that decision. So what we found out is, again, through 99% uh, accuracy, so not 100%, again, relying on confidence intervals and levels. So what we've done is we found out that we can tell with a 99% confidence that if the angle separation is 240 degrees, the system will become unstable. We don't have to wait until 360 or 130 in case of center of inertia as a reference point. Now, that we say, whoa, so what? I mean, it's an academic exercise. Well, yes, in a way. On the other hand, reduction in time is almost half a second. So you know what's going to happen half a second earlier. Half a second is nothing in, in our terms, like the way how we operate, but in the way how protection operates, in a way of deploying signal in time, it makes a big difference. So basically, this study demonstrated you can make confident decision about what's going, on to, going, what's going to happen to the system faster than what is done at the moment, which means you can deploy control action sooner. The other thing that we were playing with, thinking about the system. System is never transiently unstable alone, or small disturbance unstable, or inefficient, or unreliable. There are many aspects of the system behavior that happen at the same time. And it's a multidimensional space in which the system operates. But it's very difficult to illustrate that multidimensional space, uh, to visualize it, let alone illustrate it. So if you use two dimensions, so we can say, look, this is how the system behaves over the time of whatever, hour, five hours, year, five years, doesn't really matter. This is a trajectory in the space of two parameters that the system is following our system today. When we are capable, if we are, I question this, if we are, we can determine how far away we are from the critical position, critical emergency state. When something may go wrong, we need to be able to define this boundary. We do have these boundaries for each type of studies and analysis in person individually, individually. For small disturbance, transient stability, voltage stability, efficiency, reliability, there is this thing. So multidimensional space, multidimensional boundary when we are close to it. 
And we, we can say we kind of pretty much know where this is for the system today. System tomorrow will behave differently than system today because of different types of load and generation. So at some point, we may be closer and at some point further away from that boundary of, of criticality. So what our aim would be, irrespectively where the system is, we want to pull this down, down to be at least as safe as we are today, not worse off. The problem with that is there are uncertainties, obviously. So again, deterministic approach wouldn't help. And depending whether you consider uncertainties or not, where the system actually is, you may have a contradictory decision where you are. Now, this is an extremely difficult problem. It may not look difficult when, when I show these wiggly worms uh, on the screen, but it is very, very difficult to put in a context. So we, we looked at it, we tried to increase this in the way how it can be illustrated, so using 3D, three dimensions. So here you have small disturbance stability, here you have transient stability, and this is manifold of operating points of the system with respect to small and large disturbance stability. Once you have different structure of the system, you add more renewables, so 50% renewable penetration and slightly reduced system loading, then this is the manifold, dark gray. So there is a different system, system is at a completely different state. Now at some point, this may be worse, at some point it may be better than behavior of the old system. Now we talk about demand response, demand side management, batteries, this and that. So if you apply some of these measures, this is example with demand side management, that manifold changes again, which shows how the system will move in this space depending on what we do with, him, with it. Yeah, logical. But how do you illustrate that? So that people can quickly grasp it. You can't go and illustrate every single phenomenon separately. So what we did, we developed one index which combined all stability aspects together. And using that index, you can identify areas where some action may help, make it better, and some make it worse. This is an example of the operation of the system with and without renewables and after applying demand side management action. Now, demand side management, the demand response, is done for various purposes. Most frequently is to reduce some loading. Now, when you reduce the load of the system by disconnecting some loads, you are not only reducing the amount of power you're using, you are changing the composition of the load. When you change the composition of every single bus, when you disconnect something, when you change composition of load, you're changing the load model, which means you are changing load response to disturbance. So when you disconnect all the loads, your system has different pattern of loads in terms of size and different models. If the disturbance happens, system will react differently. And this is an example which shows that when you reduce the demand to lower the peak, what happens during the day with your combined small, large, and frequency stability following that demand side management action in each of the hours? Because in some hours here, like, you disconnect the demand to reduce the load, and you have shifted demand in early morning. The consequence of that is that at different hours, you actually made system better or worse from the point of view of stability. And this is something that is never been considered when talking about demand side management. Now, this can be much worse or much better depending on how much renewables you have and how much load you are connecting or disconnecting. The approach that I'm using in, in all these studies is, as I said, it's uncertainties and risk. Now, this is adopted from immunity curves in power quality, because I mentioned I worked in power quality for many years in the past. Now, there we have definition of uh, disturbance level in the system and immunity level. So disturbances are obviously probabilistically distributed, as is immunity. It's not one line. And the problem appears only when, only here. When these two cross, this is the risk of something going wrong. Now, a new system, 
when we add low carbon technologies, be it those generators or loads, the uh, disturbance level may increase, in which case risk increases, or it may decrease, risk changes again. So what we actually have to determine for every operating point in the future is this. So are we getting more or less secure, stable, efficient, reliable, whatever, depending on the system operating condition? And I am arguing for working on establishing this. Risk, this is a risk of something going wrong. Now, if you now map this back to resilience, this would be risk in a case of low frequency, low, low probability, high impact events. So how big is this risk? And it cannot be ever done using deterministic studies. Clearly, ability level of the system will also change. I, I kept it here fixed so to, to, to make the illustration uh, easier to follow. But when you change the composition of the system, immunity also changes it because if you, if you connect more uh, say PV generators, uh, resilience of those inverters is not as good as resilience of synchronous generators. So your immunity of the system also changes. So this area here will move left and right all the time. It will not be just determined by the uh, disturbance level of the system. So we develop a method for assessing risk. So this is again risk for small disturbance stability. So we define, this didn't exist before we did this. So this is a uh, this, this line here is a risk profile defined in a certain way so that we can establish what is the risk of something going wrong in case of uh, small disturbance stability and loads again. Loads are easier to model uh, than generation at least, so we, we have to start from somewhere and there is a, a longer track record in modeling loads than in, in renewable generation anyway. So what we came up with are profiles like this, which illustrate what is the risk of system becoming unstable or less stable depending on different parameters. So for example, if you have a large percentage of dynamic loads in the system and the system gets more loaded, risk of something going wrong is increasing. Here, similarly, if dynamic load time constant is reducing and system loading is increasing. So if you have faster loads in a highly loaded system, risk of instability is becoming bigger. This is obviously produced by producing something like that and then working out the areas of red and, and, and blue. So uh, which one is stable, which is unstable. But this is illustration here for calculating risk for uh, small disturbance stability based on load models. We've done similar thing, I don't have a slide here, for frequency, uh, uh, risk of frequency instability depending on penetration of renewable generation. We also developed a uh, risk curves for, for, for that type of analysis. And I'm going to finish off with complex systems with integrated power and communication networks uh, using uh, something called complex network theory or graph analysis. So with the two systems, electrical and communication, we are trying to, from our perspective, we are trying to identify which buses need to be protected because if they fail in integrated system, they can cause the largest problem to the system as a whole. If you take another look on that problem, you can think of it as which buses I should disable to get more chaos in the system. So it depends whether you're looking as an attacker or defender. I was looking at it from the point of view of defending the system. Now, because the systems are interconnected, information flows from one to the other. Information flows first from communication network to the power network to tell the power network what's going on. Then power network is sending control signals through communication network to control some of the buses. 
And this interconnection can be sometimes it, uh, one way, sometimes it's a bidirectional communication. And to make it easier, uh, we represent it as a 3D uh, uh, interconnection. So one is the electrical system, the other is communication system. So there is interaction between the buses within the system, each of them separately. And there are vertical, vertical connections between them. The yellow buses, yellow highlighted buses, buses 2, 20, and 19, and thick dashed or solid lines are critical components in the system, which means if they are somehow disabled, the biggest consequences for the interconnected infrastructure will be. Obviously, we then could rank all the buses in the system. There are 20, they're small, this is small network. 23 buses, and you can see clearly here, depending on parameter you're looking at, which bus in the system is the critical. Obviously, 16, 20, and they are different. Some are, uh, some are electrical and some are uh, ICT buses. Now, moving on, that's fine. Reliability network specific buses. So we went, uh, we want to be a little bit more adventurous. So we took a system with uh, 1,326 buses, real network with real scatter system. Model that, it looks, I know, like a Hedgehog. And what we did with this, after a couple of years of studies, we came up with, with, uh, with a table like this, where the size of the red dot indicates criticality of the bus. So, for example, ICT bus, 88, power bus, 38, and say ICT bus, 73. So these buses are critical ones in the interconnected infrastructure. So if you disable one of them, the consequences for the system as a whole will be the largest. Now, some of them will have more effect on their own network, for example, ICT bus on ICT network, but some of them will also have effect on the other infrastructure. And this analysis encapsulates both of these together. So, the future for us, I think, will be around these three areas. Data analytics, probabilistic and modeling, real-time risk limiting control. Now, if you look at the areas, data analytics is not power engineering. Probabilistic modeling, that's practically mathematics. Real-time risk limiting control is either mathematics or control, so no power. Now, these are the ways how uh, I and other people working in the area, and industry. After talking a lot with the UK power industry, this is how they see, or how we see, uh, what the challenges are. For data analytics, for modeling, for control, you can see here I identified core skills that are needed in organizations like yours and other utilities. And if you look at them, I can't see electrical engineering anywhere. <laughs> Not that I am. I am by training uh, electrical power engineer. I, I've studied power engineering zillion years. I'm not against power engineering. What I'm talking about, the system and the problems that we are facing will need us, but we are already here. We need more people, we need new people, we need new skills, and these new skills will come from different areas. So uh, for me, it is too late, I won't probably be uh, around to see the changes, but if someone like me comes here, say 20 years from now, the audience will be dramatically different. It won't be, I assume that most of you are electrical engineers here. I'm sure that in 20 years from now, most people in the audience will not be electrical engineers. 
I thank you for your attention. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. That's uh, well, lots of people. Very, very happy to see everyone. It's a bit humbling uh, having to present after Yoritz, I have to say. But I think there will be like nice, uh, nice follow up. And uh, I think you also recognize that there are many, uh, many similar things, at least from a conceptual uh, perspective. So uh, we we are going to talk about still uncertainty. We'll start with. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in this case, we take the perspective, the long-term perspective, so planning and investment. Particular rather than like um, uh, operation security and <laughs> stability, as uh, as we just saw. So when we look at uh, the perspective uh, of of the planners and investors, uh, more more, more in general, so concerning the market, well, it's not really a problem of technologies in the sense that we're really spoiled for choice. And here you will recognize like the the kind of the main areas and main interconnectors of the uh, Australian uh, East Coast. And here, like a total representation uh, of uh, the main areas of the system, including potential investments that we're looking into, particularly if you look at what AIM is doing with the integrated system plan. And of course, you can have like new uh, interconnectors across the system. You could uh, uh, invest in new form of generation, uh, new forms of storage could be batteries, uh, uh, could be um, pumped hydro, uh, but uh, and of course, there could be different types of uh, renewables. And depending on the technology you would use, of course, the planning would change. Uh, however, all the technologies are there. We don't really need uh, somehow to invent new uh, technologies. So, on the other hand, there are objectives we would like to um, meet uh, moving forward. And for example, we uh, could look at uh, famous net zero uh, objectives. And again, this can be actually achieved in many different ways. So this picture here uh, is taken from uh, the um, uh, from the uh, from, from national grid uh, in the UK. Uh, they're like basically looking at the future scenarios. Uh, the future scenarios that are fundamentally de depending on uh, how much you want to change uh, the way that we uh, you know, look at energy from society perspective and how fast we want to, to go in terms of decarbonization. Then there are different scenarios and different futures that we could uh, um, we could foresee. However, many of them are actually eventually net zero by 2050, and it's like the way the national grid uh, was was uh, um, looking at the problem. So it's not a technology problem, and we know that there are many different ways potentially to 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 get to where we would like to. Assuming that, for example, net zero is where we would like to get to. So what is the the problem really when we look at uh, uh, planning? Well. Essentially, this is uh, the, the problem statement, and I will try to elaborate on this throughout the presentation. Like, how can we facilitate a risk-aware, proactive infrastructure investment? Now, what does this mean? Uh, again, this is like still uh, the, the, the Australian system. Then if you zoom out, uh, like Victoria, Victoria, you will see here the uh, renewable, large-scale renewable energy zones that have been uh, proposed um, well, from like a like few years ago, and now there, there are lots of discussions, and many of them are actually being um, implemented. So, fundamentally, the way that uh, we look at uh, the system is changing not only from a point of view of the technology and the operation, which is not what what Yoitz has presented before, but also if you think of uh, the way that we plan and invest uh, into uh, in, into technology in this new system. Let me let me try to give an example. If you look at uh, 50 years ago, how long would you would have like a few uh, types of power plants you would invest in? It would be like nuclear, coal, gas, pretty much. So how long would it take uh, to like plan for and then build uh, eventually a, let's say, a coal power plant? Months, six months, five years, 10 years? 10 years. How long does it take to say plan and then build a 500 kilometers transmission line. Months, six months, five years or 10 years? Years. Five. Okay. Now, how long does it take to build the largest generator that you have here in Western Australia, which is the distributed rooftop PV? A 
if we have enough PV, like supply, it can be done in, in a month, right? So do you see why we have a problem fundamentally? It's like before, you have uh, investment and, and planning of generation and uh, infrastructure that will have the same time scale, five to 10 years. So effectively, whether in a market system or not, we would actually co-develop, co-plan generation and transmission. Now, with renewables coming to a system either distributed or large scale, in a matter of months, potentially, and transmission still taking, and not only transmission, I mean, distribution networks are very similar. I mean, when you look at the scale of the planning that you need. Well, with, with infrastructure that still takes five years or 10 years, the only way is you need to proactively invest into transmission and, and network in general to anticipate the coming of the renewables. Otherwise, what happens is that you have a huge bottleneck and huge backlog of, uh, of, of renewables coming to your system. Does it ring a bell? Mm -hmm. So this is actually just uh, the, the, it just naturally how the system has changed. So the only way we need to anticipate now, what is the risk when you try to anticipate what will happen over the next 10 years? Well, obviously you can be very wrong and therefore there is a huge gigantic stranded asset now that you have in the system. So. Either you are too late, and this costs billions because you do not facilitate the re renewables coming to a system, or it will cost you billion because you are wrong and you never use the asset. So, what I'm going to show you now, that will look very much like an, an academic exercise, is actually the only way that we can seriously save billions and hundreds of billions when we look at the planning problem, because there is no other way of doing it. In fact, Effectively, the problem is uh, how do we plan for the system when there is not one future, there are multiple futures. This is coming from the uh, Integrated System Plan 2020. So it's easy to see, well, okay, but I know that it would be a wind farm there, wind farm there, wind farm there, and this will happen over the next 20 years. Really? Well, then why, why are we doing this exercise in the emo? I believe that the interest system plan is the best uh, thing, like the, the kind of plan in the world, I would say. But no, there are, of course, other countries trying to do the same, starting from the from National Grid uh, uh, in the UK. Everyone has got the same problems. Like, how do you anticipate this future? And it's not only, of course, about renewables. Are we going to have hydrogen or not? Obviously, this will change completely the scale of certain types of investment. For example, just to give an example. Are we going to have a lot more distributed resources or a lot more large-scale resources? Again, completely changing the scale and type of investment. So you understand why you know, we have these multiple futures, and it's really difficult to then understand how you deal with these uncertainties across multiple scenarios. And the most important, how do you understand the risk of investment? As I said, the risk is either you invest too little, and then you pay billions because you do not facilitate renewables or other technologies, or you have a risk of stranded assets, again, it costs you billions and billions. So this idea of understanding this risk is actually what fundamentally is missing today uh, in, in, in any planning exercise. There's not a clear understanding of it, because of course the exercise that we'll show you later, they do not, are not probabilistic at all. I mean, going back to uh, what you also was mentioned, it's like it's, it's fundamentally deterministic problem. So, we did uh, actually quite uh, some work with, uh, in, in UK, with National Grid, and uh, I mean, the title of the project tells you everything, because it's called like Study of Advanced Modeling for Network Planning Under Uncertainty. So basically, National Grid asked us fundamentally to look at the problem that I just told you and say, okay, can you dissect it and l let us understand really what the issues are? And uh, the fundamental motivation was that they were using one metric to uh, make decisions for, for defining investment. It's called, the metric is called uh, uh, least worst uh, regret uh, metric. Uh, you, know, you, you might be familiar with that. Uh, this, instead of using basically costs or expected costs, National Grid will use uh, regrets, which is basically the pain that you feel once you realize that you are wrong. Now, obviously, trying to minimize regrets, minimize the, the, the pain of because you're very wrong, 
is uh, uh, somehow something that from a risk perspective uh, is considered risk averse. And this is fine because, I mean, as a, as a system operator in general, uh, you would like to be risk averse because, you know, you don't want to, like, you know, and we know like, how much, you know, we try to avoid blackouts and all that. However, the, being risk averse has got a cost. And therefore, the regulator of the UK, when to said, look, I mean, it's under understandably you have new risk averse with these metrics you're using, but what is the cost on, uh, on, on consumers? So we performed a number of studies and, 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 and analysis, and basically we looked at try to understand what is actually, how do you compare cost and how, how do you compare regrets? However, we also introduced the fact that fundamentally, if for cost you will look at expected cost, also for the regrets, actually, you should look at different scenarios or somehow some forms of expected regrets to be really consistent with different approaches. So no surprise, you know, this kind of, this kind of, these actually tools that, this, this, this kind of picture are from the real tools that we developed for National Grid. So somehow gives them now an idea that uh, depending on the strategy that uh, you uh, employ, each number corresponds to I built that line or I built another line or built a transformer. And depending on the weights that you give uh, to different scenarios, uh, then whether you work, work with cost or you work with regrets, uh, your investment strategies uh, change significantly, may change significantly. However, with this double perspective of the cost and the regrets, you are actually able to control risk uh, uh, much, uh, much better. And in fact, uh, if you are, are familiar with the, actually the later, now National Grid is using now this new matrix that we introduced, this kind of least worst way to regret because it allowed a better control risk compared to a complete risk averse uh, uh, metric and uh, can uh, be, is much more compatible with the idea of expected cost that everyone is familiar with. And then later on, IEM also picked up uh, our work for National Grid uh, and, uh, uh, and implementing in the, in the latest uh, integrated system plan. So effectively, the SP methodology now is also based on this kind of metric that we, uh, that we introduced. So it looks great. Everyone was very happy, but here in the UK, because eventually we, we tried to uh, uh, attack one of the, the problems. It was like this of understanding your risk investment much better. However, it does not address the other fundamental problem, that all the ways that we look at scenarios, and even if we look at um, the regret analysis that uh, intrinsically um, requires a comparison of scenarios, well, the modeling fundamentally, the methodology, is always deterministic. <laughs> and uh, again, even if we look at the expectation of that, actually it's just uh, like uh, a fancy way of, of, of pretending to be probabilistic, but actually is really fundamentally deterministic, uh, deterministic planning. Now, what happens with uh, deterministic planning and why we really need to, to, to change it? Now, you look at, uh, it's very simple, natural, with certain demand here, supply, there are different generators, G1, G2, G3, and then now you need to, basically, you need to try to understand whether, as a planner, as an investor, you would uh, go with solar farms nearby the demand, or maybe you would go with uh, um, wind farms, so they are a little bit farther. But then, of course, if you are far away and the demand is here, you still need to transfer power uh, to where the demand is. So you would need, uh, perhaps, to invest into something else. Now, we, we designed this example, really, you know, for kind of uh, teaching purposes, actually. And with the way that we designed the example, effectively, you end up uh, building a line and say, well, actually, the best thing you could do is probably, given like uh, prevalent prices on that, you build a wind farm and then you build a line to uh, reinforce basically this kind of connection. And this is pretty standard approach. And in fact, uh, in a way or in the other, in uh, the planning and investment that you receive around the world, there is always some form of investment in lines. Now, however, what would happen if you start seriously introducing uncertainty? And for example, the fact that uh, the cost of solar PV, therefore the cost of a solar farm, across uh, uh, a few years in the future, could actually change significantly, as in fact it happens when we talk about solar farms, talk about uh, storage, all that. And uh, you know, it could go a little bit up, could go 
uh, very very down or you know like different somehow trajectory for the cost of technology. Now, when you have to make decisions under uncertainty, that is actually the the the, the real case, you know, uh, that 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 they work in in the real world. Well, so, and, and you give it to a model that actually can deal with uncertainty. So these kind of models are fundamentally stochastic models. This is the domain of stochastic optimization. Again, nothing to do with power system engineers. We need to talk to mathematicians, but there are very well established techniques to perform this uh, stochastic optimization, uh, um, um, to develop these stochastic optimization models. In fact, it tells you somehow you try to anticipate multiple futures and you try to anticipate multiple investments and how best uh, optimal investments do interact with each other in, in the future. So when you do that, something like magic happens and you will understand why I really mean magic. Instead of uh, investing into a line, suddenly you will start investing into two completely different pieces of asset. QB is a, is a quadrature booster, basically phase shift transformers, and B is a battery. Right, okay, what is a line doing from a sort of physical perspective? It's basically using, creating arbitrage opportunities between two nodes that are far from each other, particularly trying to bring wind down to demand. What is a quadrature booster doing? Well, somehow it's helping the system to reroute power flows and then say, well, instead of just to rely on kickoff flows here, to see how the power flow goes, I, I help me a little bit by basically changing the equipment impedance and I try to reroute the power flow. So it's trying to, to perform some form of spatial arbitrage but with more flexibility compared to a line because no, you, you still have kick of loss uh, involved in here. Then you have a battery. What does a battery do? A battery creates something completely new that is like a temporal arbitrage. So effectively, a quadrature booster and a battery give you so much more flexibility because they can give you a little bit of spatial arbitrage, a little bit of temporal arbitrage. And when you do that, actually, basically, it allows you to do like lots of different things. Whether, and then while you do this, basically wait to see what happens to the price of the solar farms and then potentially you know, whether you should go with a wind farm or solar farm. So the, way, the, the possibility of operating with a flexible asset also gives you the, the, the possibility of planning somehow in different ways. And eventually what you do is like you don't, you don't build at all a line, you end up just building this kind of technologies and you keep operating with that and eventually you end up building both a solar farm and a wind farm depending on which scenario materializes and integrating more renewables than you would have done otherwise. So what is the magic in all this? The magic is that suddenly with this methodology you have investments in this kind of smart grid technologies that otherwise you will not see in the system. And in fact we demonstrated with work that we did years ago in the UK that fundamentally when we're comparing for example investment into lines and investment into storage and demand response Fundamentally, there was no way that you could really compare the two technologies. The lines would always win. But the problem was not that the lines are better than, than, than storage. The problem is that with a deterministic cost-benefit analysis like we have, naturally there is a bias towards, this, towards like this kind of traditional asset as, as opposed to the new asset, like the smart grid asset. So by changing the methodology, actually, you reveal new value for these kind of solutions. Particularly, you reveal, you no, know, everyone talks about this option value of technologies. Now, well, this option value, this is the methodology to actually quantify mathematically the option value of technologies, and both, I would say, wire and non-wire solutions. Because in this case, and you know, on this specific uh, test case, we wanted to highlight how you could uh, see smart grid technologies really come into the system, which otherwise you would never see. But on the other hand, the kind of modeling also gives you this idea of proactive investments that we started with. So the idea that actually you can understand in which wire you may 
invest proactively to anticipate, for example, renewals that are coming up and not run the risk of ending up with a stranded asset. Say, so, well, you really need to build that because it creates the optionality to have all the different types of renewals coming to the system later on. Whereas at the moment, we just wait and see if renewals come or not, and actually we, do, we, we, we just lose uh, billions and billions, as, as I said. So on these lines, basically what we have developed is a version that we call a stochastic integrated system plan, where instead of looking individually, scenario by scenario, the, the system, integrated system plan like I was done uh, in the work, basically we developed a much more uh, finely resolved uh, view of the world, where basically we concatenated the scenarios of the integrated system plan, and now there are lots of decision points where actually across the next 15, 20, 30 years, you can make a flexible um, fle flexible investment looking into different options. And these different options that we looked at in particular were transmission versus storage. Do we need to build more transmission or do we need to build more storage and of what type? Now, if you look at the results uh, of this initial work that we did, not surprising, stochastic planning reveals new role for storage. Suddenly, you see that uh, you see a lot more investments into batteries of different types than actually transmission like uh, we would have seen in the classical integrated system plan. Because it's the methodology itself uh, that starts more seriously looking again at this optionality that uh, we would, uh, um, that, that, that smart grid technologies actually can, uh, uh, can, can bring. So fundamentally, this kind of approach can try to help uh, with, the, with the question, you know, that is like always asked, how much and what storage uh, do, we, uh, do, do, do we actually need uh, in the system? Particularly important because uh, if you look at this kind of sketch, for example, let's take the case of, of Europe here, okay? So this like power capacity of uh, storage technologies against energy capacity of storage technologies for different penetration levels of renewables. Now, the interesting thing is that, uh, and these are just many different studies that we put together. So for increasing penetration levels of renewables, what you see is that the power capacity that you need uh, Different sources will give you different numbers. However, the trends are that the deeper the penetration, uh, the, the, the larger, of course, is the capacity you need. And this capacity grows linearly with the penetration level. However, when you look at the energy capacity, so the gigawatt hours, not the gigawatt, what, when you increase the penetration level, also the requirements for storage increase. However, you see how the scale here is logarithmic. So power grows linearly and energy grows logarithmically. So you, you need to change with time while you invest into more renewables and so on, the type of storage that you need, which again, you move from shallow storage like, uh, like batteries to, uh, to, to kind of deep, deep storage, long duration storage, ideally you know, storage in pump charge oil and, uh, and, and hydrogen moving forward. Now, what, however, what you see here is just a, a, a static picture, right? You say, okay, when I'm 25%, I need batteries. When I am 100%, I will need uh, hydrogen and, uh, and, and pump charge. But the question is, how do you move forward across uh, this penetration level that might take 30, 40, 50 years? And then how do I actually understand that, for example, I don't want to have, uh, like, 50 gigawatt of batteries, only to realize that in five years that you will need something else, right? So how do you try to anticipate all of this also from a storage perspective, besides the kind of competition with, uh, with, with, with transmission that I, mentioned, uh, um, that I mentioned before? So all this kind of work is now, we are doing together uh, with, with AIMO uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the East Coast, within uh, uh, this project with the Global uh, Power System Transformation Consortium, some of you have heard. Uh, this is effectively uh, sponsored by uh, CSRO, that is a part of this consortium, and AIMO uh, is basically you know, the technical uh, advisor on, on this. And uh, you will recognize somehow here the, the, the new scenarios, the new integrated system plan. And what we're doing is like we're developing this stochastic version of the SP with AIMO's inputs, the real data, and the feedback, 
Also try to understand the risk assessment, so the risk of stranded assets uh, and, and, and all other aspects that I mentioned before. So we, to do this, actually, we are, we have, we are going into understanding quite some, with some high resolution the geographical distribution or the investments that you might have. So interconnectors are not only just across regions, but actually uh, across states, but across major regions uh, inside states, which is what now the, the new ISP is doing. Then we are using quite a refined operational model for, for, the, for the operational system. I mean, you will recognize here the, the behavior of South Australia, it's kind of a very famous picture. So the only way to really capture this kind of behavior in planning is to have uh, time series simulations with a high resolution and all kind of proper mathematical modeling of system operation with uh, um, unique commitment and flexibility constraints of that. And finally, the understanding of what kind of security services and security constraints you would need moving forward. So the model is uh, effectively, uh, it's a planning model, but the operation is constrained uh, with uh, like real operational constraints, basically inertia constraints, uh, fast frequency response, frequency response, flexibility, ramping, different types of reserve constraints. So all the kind of real constraints you will see in, in system operation or in the market uh, eventually. And the reason to do this is because these constraints actually can change investment into technologies. For example, we've already seen, because the model allows to decide where to invest into different types of batteries that can provide security services, as opposed to, for example, synchronous condensers providing uh, inertia, and we have the ability to introduce uh, regional um, system strength constraints, for example. So the model somehow is flexible to identify that different technologies can do different things, and then depending on how you constrain the, 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 the model, you see that actually you see more investment, for example, syn synchronous condensers as opposed to batteries, as opposed to uh, interconnectors. But also interconnectors, for example, you can borrow security services from other regions, right? So it's a very fine co-optimization uh, of all of this uh, uh, together. Now, as part uh, of uh, uh, this kind of the studies that we're doing in the project, then we're also trying to answer another big question with the help of another project, and which is not, again, very, very like big question. Do we move electrons, or, sorry, it's not off, it, uh, it's all here, or do we move uh, uh, molecules? So effectively, like when you have all these renewable energy zones, and we look at a future where we want to have export we want to, to maybe not want, to, we, we have, of course, you know, lots of industry that requires a hydrogen, ammonia, and all that. What do we, how do we transfer power? Do we transfer in the form of electricity, and is it high voltage AC, high voltage DC, what is it? Or in the form of molecules with hydrogen pipelines with different uh, characteristics. And from an architecture perspective, do we have a centralized uh, hydrogen production, where effectively you bring, we, I'm talking about green hydrogen, of course, we bring electricity from renewable energy zones to, for example, port, uh, produce hydrogen you know, and, and, and transport it away uh, to the UK, for example, or we have a distributed approach where actually hydrogen is uh, produced uh, where renewables are, and then we transfer, um, we transfer uh, mo molecules, uh, effectively. So this work uh, is uh, it's a number is part of the work we're doing for the future fuels CRC and we have developed a suite of uh, modern tools we call IGHS which stand basically for integrating electricity gas hydrogen uh, systems. So as part of the modeling basically this is uh, the the mapping of no this is our, our, our tool the mapping of the integrated electricity and gas system that we've already done. Uh, uh, for, for the future fuels, so, and this is like, this is like, a, a, like a snapshot of the kind of modeling that we've done for, for Victoria, because effectively you have the integration of electricity and gas, uh, hydrogen, you, also, you, you can also perform hydrogen injection into the gas network, and then you can track, for example, how much hydrogen and where hydrogen is going across the network to, to answer a number, a number of questions, and then you do this in operation. And then the next step is, uh, 
for planning, like once you have renewables and once you have the usage of hydrogen or ammonia or, or, or other, say, future fuels, what do you have in between? Do you, do you transport, as, as I was saying, do you move uh, electricity as high voltage as CODC or pipelines? And then what kind of storage do you need in between in a centralized form or in a dis di distributed form? Is it batteries? Is it pump charger? Is it just hydrogen storage? Or actually can you store to a large extent energy in uh, the, the line pack that you will have uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the pipelines? There is a very substantial amount of energy, energy storage in, in the pipeline itself, uh, currently in the gas system and uh, um, moving, uh, mo moving forward. So somehow, just to give you an idea, if you look at a scenario like this one, where say, okay, this is, this is, this is in Queensland, look at scenario for 2040, taken from the integrated system plan, and then you say, okay, in here I have a port from which I need to export hydrogen, so I have a certain hydrogen demand because of my contracts and all that, and then I have uh, all these renewables that are coming um, along, uh, uh, you know, uh, along the coast or a little bit far from the coast. So how do we build an integrated uh, electricity and hydrogen infrastructure, including like storage devices? And then the modeling basically would tell you, for example, that uh, look, this part, this part of the network you need a high voltage DC system, and then you get here, and then here, basically, you have a conversion station hydrogen, and then you transfer hydrogen, and you, in between, you need, uh, again, compressor stations and uh, uh, electrolytes and all that. Whereas in here, for example, you're much closer, you can do just with a high voltage AC system, and then you arrive here, and uh, you bring together the hydrogen that was transferred, and then you need to uh, create new, uh, new hydrogen. So somehow, it, it gives you, uh, with, it, it captures all the physics and the dynamics you have in the electricity system and the uh, gas hydrogen system, and then the uh, the economics or different types of investments. Again, including the, tr the transport options, but also the uh, the storage uh, the storage options. Now, this this will look very much like some use cases that I've seen, for example, in, up in Pilbara. that are like very similar like uh, investments and all that being like, proposed. So, just in case you think. Uh, that uh, we are forgetting Western Australia, we're actually building the disintegrating model also for the gas and the electricity system for Western Australia, and I would be keen to perform some kind of studies, uh, so looking at the uh, infrastructure investment for electricity and hydrogen in Western Australia, that would be actually much more substantial than what we will have for in, uh, uh, in the, um, uh, in, in the uh, East Coast. Now, again, is, and this somehow is all part of the general studies and methodology that uh, they were considered before. One of the things that you could address uh, methodologically with uh, this idea of planning under uncertainty is also the plan for, for the black swan. Like, what do I mean by planning for the black swan? Event. That's exactly extreme events, exactly. High impact, low probability events, the Yovitsa was mentioned before. But again, in this, in this case, we take the perspective of the planning. What do I build? What do I need to build to anticipate uh, the very extreme event? We're still talking about planning under uncertainty. It is now that the uncertainty is as bad as it gets, because it's like low probability, so very nasty to use to identify mathematically, and high impact, so very nasty for the real world. By the way, do you know why we talk about black swan? We, we, said we have a lot of black, black swans and we, we, we love them, right? So what's wrong with the black swans? It didn't exist until you came to Australia. That is exactly the thing. So this comes from uh, so Juvenal, a, a Latin author of the second uh, century after uh, yeah, second century. In one of his uh, books wrote this expression is as rare as a black swan. Basically, no, they don't exist in Europe, right? They're only white swans. So juvenile meant uh, something that doesn't exist. Do you know what he was talking about? He was talking about a nice person. So we say, a nice person is as rare as a black swan. So the, the Dutch had to come to Australia to find some nice persons, probably. 
eventually with the, uh, the Aboriginal at the time. So that is the, the idea of the black swan. And you know, in uh, like we've been working a lot in the past on this, uh, we came up with what we called, uh, you know, <laughs> very fancily, the resilience trilemma. Say, do you want to, uh, if you need to, to plan for the extreme events, do you make a system stronger? Do you make the system bigger? Or do you make this, the system smarter? So this was also actually the, uh, the, the framework that the AMC used uh, for their resilience work that they did uh, a few years ago. They took exactly our framework to develop their work that they, 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 they published a couple of years ago. Now, it could be, it could be you would think that uh, with, by just building networks, uh, so by building redundancy, as we've always done in power systems, not only networks, but redundancy in general, like reserves and all that, you would enhance resilience. It's intuitive, right? Let's make the system bigger, more networks, more spare capacity, more reserves. Well, no. Daniel Kirshen and Goran Strubach are like very good friends uh, and uh, uh, colleagues or ex-colleagues uh, and uh, a postdoc supervisor too, uh, Goran. So uh, they wrote this very nice paper years ago. They were not talking about resilience, uh, but the, the concept was very similar. Why investments do not prevent blackouts? And the principle is eventually that the more you invest uh, in networks and everything, the more the system, particularly the economic system, the market, will actually use that system and the system will just become more and more fragile, as 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 you always showed before. Particularly in like new in the new world, more actually means also more fragile, and we need to sort of deal with that properly. And somehow, it's just inevitable. Do you know who these two gentlemen are? So this is uh, uh, Gustav Kirchhoff, and this is Adam Smith. So it's inevitable somehow that the economics, uh, economic laws, uh, got always like a very, very big impact uh, on the physical laws. Of course, there's only, only, only I mean, type of laws that they always uh, apply, and you can guess which ones. So, however, now this kind of thinking, therefore, sorry, just you know this idea say, well, investments actually do not help you so much with resilience. So what do you do? Well, obviously, you need to do something different, which is like the kind of smartness that was mentioned also earlier, where the stochastic tool enables to invest into smart technologies rather than just network asset, which, which comes particularly you know, handy when you need to deal with this kind of uh, things. And to give a, a concrete example, let's take something that unfortunately uh, very close to, to us, uh, which is bushfires. And one of the big questions is, how do we protect uh, the system against, uh, against bushfires? Now, in operation, we know better than me that one of these, like, you just become completely risk averse. We were discussing this before, and uh, you know, we, we, we discuss this a lot with, with Dean, also in a special issue, actually, where there are like, lots of interesting papers from, from Australian bushfires, like coming from a, a Power Energy magazine special issue. Um, and basically, say, well, there is a, a corridor. And there is a fire coming potentially across this corridor. What do you do? Well, in operation, you just switch off this corridor, right? But in planning, is it possible that maybe you should not have built this corridor at all? However, this corridor, in normal operation, saves lots of money. So how do you not build uh, an, a corridor that is saving lots of money, for example, not because it brings electricity to a rural community, and maybe just because there is a bushfire every 100 years, where we wish it was only every 100 years, so you say, well, you shouldn't build it because there, there may be a bushfire. So it's a very, very difficult uh, um, decision to make. And if you look at the current cost-benefit analysis, of course, the answer is build the corridor. And then, of course, you build the corridor, and then a bushfire happens, and there are catastrophic consequences in terms of uh, economics. Now, by changing the way that you approach uh, the, the modeling, by introducing this kind of stochastic modeling and uh, risk analysis, uh, there are very interesting things that can emerge. So in this exercise, you know, and this again was just really built uh, to be you know, very simple to understand, 
Case A is the typical investment that you would perform. And so, okay, you have a, a traditional cost benefit analysis, and this cost benefit analysis, the rare events are not really seen as part of the game. So, what you would do is you would build as assets line one and line two, that is two lines to supply this community, line five and line six, these two lines here, this corridor that can be subject to bushfire to supply this community here. And then there will be some micro generator uh, and uh, some uh, demand response too. Okay, and then we say now, this is in planning, so this is your plan. Your total cost of the planning is $33,000, whatever it means, of course, it's just like, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an exercise. Then what happens is that the bushfire actually arrives and you, you look at the value of lost load. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, uh, the bushfires in, in, in Gippsland a few years ago, where basically communities, communities were isolated for weeks. The Navy had to go there to, to rescue people. You will remember that. Now, you look at the cost of a bushfire like that and say, well, I planned by not considering bushfire. Then bushfire comes and look at the value of lost load and all that. And the cost becomes 52,000. Because the cost of your system doubles because there are the, the bushfire happens. Yeah, well, it's a bad luck. Well, no, not really. Because what you could have done is, uh, by changing the modeling approach and the methodology, making sort of risk averse and stochastic in a way, the modeling would tell you to invest into line one and line two, of course. But then it would also tell you to invest into line three and line four and only one of these lines, line five. So basically say, instead of having two lines, only build one line and build the two lines here so that if there is a bushfire, you can bypass it. But however, this is done basically also under normal conditions now, you do this. However, in addition, you also invest into distributed resources here. And this distributed resource can actually help you reduce your operational cost in sort of your, your everyday Situation. So when you look at the cost of doing all this, you now have a much higher investment cost for line, much higher investment cost for PV and this resource you didn't have before. However, your operational cost become much less because now some of your supply is local and you, know, you can save money. And then if the bushfire happens or not, say in expectation, actually the impact that you have is very, very limited. Because basically, even if there is a bushfire, this system with the local resources in the ability of bypassing the bushfire will keep operating normally. So eventually, you end up with something that's just a little bit more expensive than the previous case. However, avoiding lots of pain if the bushfire were to happen. Now, all of this may seem logical when I present it, right? But there's no way in the cost-benefit analysis that you, as a, as a utility, would uh, put forward to AER, then you can do this now. It's not possible because the cost benefit analysis is wrong. It doesn't allow to capture this kind of value because a bushfire is very, very rare and is not part basically of the cost benefit analysis. So effectively, sorry, it's just, uh, effectively what happens is that again, with a new methodology, <coughs> this highlights the value of smart grid technology and, and distributed resources as insurance policy. And insurance, insurance, by definition, cannot be captured uh, by a deterministic approach, right? That's exactly how you know, all insurance theory uh, is, is, is developed. So that is exactly what we have to do in the future. We really want to understand how we, we should plan better the system for this. So less redundancy and actually smarter, smarter grid. So say, who is stopping us from moving from a redundant grid to a smart grid? Well, effectively, it's the curse of the average. The fact that all the methodologies that we use, they all focus on expected cases, and they never capture the extreme cases when things could happen. And you know, if this, for example, the uh, unserved energy that we will use normally for this kind of studies, well, actually, in the real world with bushfires, this is the tail of the system that you look at. So eventually, these are the extreme situations. You know, they, they are so far away, they are so remote in terms of probabilities, they will never appear. However, the impact, sorry, this is the impact actually, the impact is very, very uh, significant, potentially. Now, the good news is that in recent work that uh, 
the, the AMC has done, again, and you know, I was their advisor, and there is this report that I wrote for them. Basically, I put forward a methodology that would include this kind of new approaches, and they're actually very, very supportive. And uh, there is a possibility that the new reliability metrics would change for the first time in the world to actually start uh, including these extreme scenarios. It's like the first step to actually change the way that we plan uh, the, the system against these very big uh, uncertainties. Now, the very last thing is uh, that also distributed resources more generally can be included into planning, not only for resilience. And again, as part of the work we're doing for CSRO and IEMO in the Global Power System Transformation Study, what we're doing is like we're actually modeling distributed energy resources as equivalent to generators, like kind of virtual power plant models and resources, facilitated by distribution system operator with all the local constraints calculated with tools like operating envelopes and these kind of things. And eventually we are, we are basically developing a bidding models for distributed energy resources subject to natural constraints that can participate in market and system operation, and therefore they can also participate somehow uh, in, in, in the planning exercise, can be, can be included in the planning exercise. So on top of uh, conventional resources, storage, transmission, there's also a role that distribution resources could play in the planning exercise that we're going to study in the, uh, in the, ongoing, in the ongoing project. This is my last slide, and I added one gentleman to the two previous gentlemen that I showed before. So who is this guy? Old guy. This old guy is that is die. So uh, I, I promise we didn't actually see each other's slides, but now that when I tell you now who this guy is, you recognize how you know the thinking is very much aligned. So this is George Danzig. Who is George Danzig? Well, that's why when in 20 years, when you know, US say, let's come again in 20 years, everyone will know it. He is the father of mathematical programming. Linear programming basically is coming from these guys here. So why do I put George Danzig? Because the model that I showed you is a very, very sophisticated mathematical model before being a physical model, a sort of techno-economic model. Basically, we need to use the most advanced uh, mathematics to solve the problem that is based in what is called actually Danzig Wolf decomposition. Because if the integrated system plan is a huge exercise, make it stochastic, basically it's like millions of times larger as a mathematical problem. So what we're doing with the, 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 the tools we have developed, like normally things that would take uh, months to run can be solved uh, in a couple of days. So we still talk about days. But uh, you know, basically, it's like hundreds of times faster. And otherwise, it would be uh, and, well. Otherwise, it would be no no way of doing it uh, at all. So again, just to stress the importance of new disciplines coming to a system. So not only data analytics and all that, but also say mathematical programming and optimization that we see more and more uh, important. Uh, yeah, uh, just acknowledgement to a number of people and uh, uh, yeah, particular to you for coming on a Friday. Friday evening, and of course, to, to Dean for organizing this, also to, to kind to do this. Thank you very much. And basically, on time, too. So, much yeah. Thank, thank you very thank much, Pierre Luigi. I, for one, have really enjoyed both presentations and learned a lot. So, thank you. Thank you so much. But is it possible? If I ask you two to come oh, yeah, here, sure. so we can ask questions. Any rotten tomatoes? <laughs> I have a question. First of all, thank you, both presenters. Um, I have a question from Pierre Luigi. Um, I'm interested to understand how you determine those probabilities because. On the economic side, I'm Matt Shanazir from the Economic Regulation Authority, so I'm mostly dealing with the economic side of this whole challenge. Um, so on the economic side, and especially on that network planning, mm -hmm. um, one of the problems is that we cannot agree on 
yeah. probabilities yeah. from those scenarios. Yeah. Look at the ISP, for example. Yeah. So which scenario going to emerge? Even IMO calls them scenarios rather than forecasts. Yeah. So one of the problems is assigning probabilities. And without those probabilities, if we don't agree on those probabilities, we can't determine an option value for real options analysis. So, so hence we go to the area of decision making on the deep onset. And once you, you mentioned least regret. So my question is how we ended up with that least regret decision. So what was the framework? Because there are different criteria or different yeah. measures. Why least regret? Because one might argue that it might bring more cost to the system. Yeah. And the second one is how you determine probabilities yeah. when we have deep uncertainty and we want to calculate an option value. Because real options analysis is very reliant on assuming a distribution or implicitly a probability. Yeah, absolutely. Or stochastic so, modeling. Yeah. All, all, great, all great questions. So uh, let, let me start from the um, least worst regret analysis. So there is something National Grid in the UK had done for several years. Yeah? And uh, fundamentally, the, it was exactly to address uh, the, the, the problem that you were mentioning. Say, well, we don't know probabilities, we don't want to talk about probabilities, uh, and we need to take uh, a, um, a, 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 like a, a, a risk profile uh, approach to any problem. So, okay, we are risk averse as a system operator, therefore, uh, least worst regret analysis was somehow the, the, the one that was most suitable. However, very, very expensive, and there are other issues like. If you look at the, the theory of that, uh, some scenarios can actually be dominant in the decision and, and there are lots of issues. That is exactly why the regulator of the UK went to a show and said, well, we're not so sure about the work that you're doing. Can you please look into something else? And that's when we decided, we, we actually discussed uh, the inclusion of probabilities in uh, the least worst regret analysis. Uh, because uh, the key point was not about agreeing on probabilities. The key point was actually about studying the impact of probabilities on the decisions. Say, National Grid is making decisions anyway, right? I build this line, only to find out that that line is built only if all the probabilities are the same. You change a little bit of probabilities, and the decision changes completely. Now, you may agree or not on probabilities, but clearly, what you would have done anyway is completely wrong. Right, I hope that you would agree with me. So that's then when the, the, the thinking moved to say, first of all, we need to have like metrics, like with probabilities, for example, that would allow us a flexibility in thinking, and actually sitting around the table, and then realize that if we change probabilities and the planning doesn't change, well, then everyone is very happy about it. If you change a little bit of probabilities and the plans look completely different, well, then we uh, need to have a more mature discussion. Because the decision would, need, would be made anyway, probabilities or not. However, with this kind of approaches, you can actually study the sensitivities and you can discuss all together. So these tools are actually not built in the same for, with the real option um, approach. The probabilities there are not to give you the, the perfect plan. The probabilities there are actually to sort of indicate what could happen under certain conditions. And then, in fact, the use of the tool is by changing those probabilities or changing other parameters, you start to, you study the risk that is associated with certain investment planning. So those tools are really not to tell you the perfect answer, but as a support, actually, to this kind of discussions. Decisions will need to be made anyway, but in this way, you actually have a very formal approach to, 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 making, to making a decision. Because you can capture the flexibility, or the optionality, but you can also understand the risk the moment actually that you parameterize across different probabilities. That's how it's going to be used. Thank you. Can I add something? The language that he used, I'm not going to do a survey now in the room, the language that he used is not the language that audience like this in power companies is used to. When I started talking about power quality 20 years ago, there was absolutely no agreement on terms and definitions. It took five years of intensive training around the world. I've been here doing this and all around the world and other people like me, just to bring people to same understanding of what risk is, 
what probabilities in current context, what least regret is. Once people accept the terminology and they come to same understanding of the issues, then we can start talking about solutions. We have, as a society of power engineers, people who run utilities, we have a much bigger problem at the moment than <laughs> solving the planning of the system, which is not being able to communicate in the language which new type of the system requires. And what we need now, I strongly believe in that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not talking like, okay, this is something that you need to hire me. No, it's not about that. What we need now, we need people going around and giving lectures on probabilistic analysis, risk analysis, investment under uncertainties, least regret, most regret, whatever. Because this is something that people who are running the system have to become familiar with as terminology and as tools before we start talking about how to solve the thing. And what the said at the end, when you say we cannot agree on probabilities, probability is input in your model. It's uncertainty of my parameter when using Morris screening technique to find which is important. So because we are afraid of probability of what do I do with this, we don't think about it as single input, which is a number. Is that number five? One, 0 0.1, let's find out, does it matter? So, uh, but the problem is, is the language. The problem is educating people in different vocabulary, which we didn't use before. When I studied, pff, I mean, this didn't exist. I mean, we, we, we studied probability in, in high school and a little bit in university, but we never talked about these things. Now, wherever you go, whatever report you read, are these words. So who, who taught us this? We have to self-teach ourselves. Sorry for the interjection, but I think this is, this is much more important than answering any question to any technical problem you may have. It's about the educating the workforce about what comes next. Okay, maybe one more question. I know it's, it's late, so... Um if that, that's okay. If there are no questions, yeah. There's no. Oh, there is a question. Oh, okay. Just one point. Yeah. The way you were talking about the uh, risk profile for different alternatives on the system. For example, if you have uh, an integrated system with only PV and low, and you have you have different events on the system, how you calculate the risk? For example, if you have a kilo event, and um, depends on the Hello, you have like a disruption two minutes for the output of your solar farm. How you calculate the risk associated with that particular event? Just you consider the frequency estimate of the system, or do you consider something else? Who are you asking? Just Both, you are. Yeah. Right. Uh, risk, you, you, well, risk is a product of probability and the consequence. Now, if we neglect now the consequence, how much things cost, so you have to run a large number of simulations to work out how many times something will go wrong. Like we did this risk analysis for load. So out of 10, or, or some other study, out of 10,000 simulations of different events, there are three cases when system is unstable. So probability of system being unstable is three out of thousand. For each of these probabilities that system is unstable, there are different consequences of it being unstable. Is it one generator, is it a big blackout, small blackout, partial blackout? How much does it cost? So these three, each will have associated cost, which you have to calculate separately. Now, risk is three out of thousand, Multiply by the cost of each event, you come up with the total value of that. So the easiest, there are other more sophisticated mathematical ways, but the easiest thing to do it is just to run a large number of studies, because you know how to do that, yeah. it's easy. A large number of studies and count how many times something goes wrong. That's the probability of, of the event. Mm. The, the bushfires and stuff like that, 
if you run it for a hundred years, and if there is one bushfire, so it's one in one in a hundred years and duration, whatever, I mean, this can be converted. That's why it becomes very low, and that's how it's calculated. And these data can be extracted. These risks now can also be extracted from the existing data. If you collect data analytic stuff that I was talking about, if you collect all data you have about the system and work out how many times in the last hundred years you had the bushfire in, I don't know, northern Tasmania in the last 200 years, as the history is all, or wherever the measurement started. It always rains there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's why I'm taking this into account. So if you do that and you, and you find out there, there were no bushfires in the last 150 years, so what is the risk of bushfire there? Well. It hasn't happened ever. So you can't say five or three or two because you don't have data. So based on past experience, we can start with some number at least initially and work out from there. Yeah, I think we are. Uh, I'm just, just sorry. And for that, when you are talking about the events, it doesn't matter it's an electrical event or uh, some events out of, out of the electrical network, it, it, it might be like false event or generation out generator or fate or uh, load connection or disconnected, everything you need to consider. Yes, you do. You do. But if you have a powerful computer, it can run on its own and produce large number of data very, very quickly. Because this, this may not be that complicated. The stuff that Luigi was talking about, uh, planning, complex plan that, that takes much more time. These are simulations can run automatically. You, you start the computer, go home. When you come back in the morning, loads of data produced. Thank you. Well, uh, be because we are at the time, I think uh, we uh, end the session here. And I thank both Jovita and Pierluigi. Okay. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you.